let me share my screen. And guys, just a kind request, those do not have a questions, please put you on mute. Uh, actually, I have one question in last session. Yeah, I will take only. Yeah, when we are uh, we are assigning any subscription from one management group to another management group, and if you implemented policy on suppose uh, uh, one HR department uh, management group, group is there and uh, one subscription A is there okay. and uh, department is there subscription B, if we implement some policies on uh, HR department uh, subscription. Or the HR department. If we move that subscription to admin, so will the policies will also move there to the admin? How it is? Let me draw it. Let me give you the exact precise answer. So you are saying, let's say we have a management group with the name HR management group. Am I right? Yes. And what is the second management group you are referring? You, you can take any, any uh, uh, like IT team. Let's say yes. operations management. Yes. Right. Okay. And let's say we have a subscription here. Maybe subscription number one is falling under HR management group, right? And you are saying we have applied some policy here at HR management group. Am I correct so far? Yes. And now you would like to move the subscription from HR management group to operations management group. You want the subscription to be present here. What yes. about the policy that we have applied? The policy is that for applicable, this policy number one, it was applicable to HR management group will no longer be applicable to the subscription. Those policies will no longer be applicable. But let's say there are some policies which were applicable to operations management group. There are some policies which are applicable on maybe policy number two. Now policy number two will be applicable on subscription number one. Does that answer your query? Yes, I, I got the answer. Like a uh, policy will be not valid. Uh, if you move the subscription from one uh, management it, group. It one. depends. It depends. What you are saying will not be true always. See, let's say if I have applied a policy here, when subscription number one was a part of HR management group, we applied policy number three here. When we will move this subscription from HR management group to marketing manage, operations management group, policy three will still be applicable. Policy three. So, policy, yeah will still be applicable. Policies, yeah, policies implemented on uh, HR management group level will be there. But if you implement the policy on subscription level, then it will be uh, like uh, forwarded to uh, the next uh, on uh, which the we are implementing this uh, policy, subscription, right? Moving the subscription. Means subscription level policy will be exist, but uh, management group level policy will be not exist on the next next level, right? When we, um, uh, is, it, is it like no, not always like this, right? Now let's say on top of both, we have got a tenant root management group. Maybe you have applied some policy here. This policy also we are applying at a management group level, right? This policy, again, we are applying at a management group level. Let's say policy number five. This policy will still be applicable to subscription number one. So, but it is on top level, so it will be inherited, right? right? But suppose if we are considering at the same level, like HR and operation level, uh, operation management group are the same level, right? And uh, if I implement the policy on HR management and uh, uh, also on the subscription, sub subscription one, okay. So the policies which are implemented on subscription level one, the subscription one, if uh, we, I am uh, moving the subscription to two op uh, operation management, then the policy will be there. Right. Absolutely. Policy three will be there. Right. But the policy one, which we have configured for HR management, it will be there on the HR management, right? It will be there on HR management group, absolutely, but it would not be applicable yeah. to subscription number one now. Yeah, but, but the policies which policy number two, which is already applied on operation management, that policy number to number two will be applicable subscription number one absolutely okay means in the, the second right hand side the policy number two and policy number three will be continued okay policy right. number five also continues yeah well, it's it's on top level it will be also continued right, right. Okay. understood 
Okay, so last time we were we discussed how can we get the Windows Server Active Directory. Let's do a quick recap, and we will also talk about hybrid identity. Now we will talk about hybrid identity. Uh, Jitendra Drago here. Uh, are you going to cover the uh, custom domain which we discussed uh, last week, or have you got the domain? Right. So I'll be covering that tomorrow, sir. I haven't got the domain yet. I'll be covering that tomorrow. But tomorrow, that part, that section will be over. Don't worry about it. It's there in my list to do list so by tomorrow by the time we end the session for this weekend that part will be covered okay right okay thank you so we are talking about the hybrid identity see here let's say we have got windows server ad windows server active directory where we have got this part in on premise right last time as well we discussed how do we get windows server ad Let's say we have a physical server or it could be a virtual machine. In this, we need to deploy the ADDS role. ADDS is Active Directory Domain Server. Right. This role we need to deploy. We can go to Server Manager and we can deploy this role. Once we deploy this role, then we get an option to promote the server to a DC. DC is a domain controller. We can promote a server to a domain controller. So once you promote a server to a domain controller, once we are promoting a server to a domain controller, we get three options. Are we adding a new forest? Are we adding a domain into an existing forest? Or are we adding a domain controller into an existing domain? If we are doing this activity for the first time, we will choose the option. We are adding a new forest. Right? When we say that we are adding a new forest, it says, hey, what is the forest root domain name? Let's say we choose jitin.com as forest root domain name. It could be any domain that you have got. Jitin.com, infotech.com, google.com, hcl.com, adobe.com, whatever domain your, your organization possess. Then we can go to Active Directory users and computers, and we can create the on-prem users we would be able to create the on-premise users. Let's say we create a user with the name Monday at jitin.com and let's say Tuesday, right? Okay, let's say Tuesday. So whatever you, users you want to create, you can create them at jitin.com. These users we would be able to create. Let's say we have got some applications. Maybe these applications are hosted in the on-premise. These are my on-prem applications. So guys, please tell me would my on-prem users, would they be able to access the on-prem applications? Would that be possible? Yes. Yes. Provided that if proper access is given to these users, they would be able to access the application. My next question is who will be doing the authentication? How will application come to know whether username and password is correct or not? Activity do that to get authentication. Sorry. AD do the authentication. Absolutely correct. AD will do the authentication. Active Directory will do the authentication. How AD will do the authentication? When we promote a server to a domain controller, basically we get an Active Directory database. In this server number one, we will be getting AD database. Right? And that is the location of AD database. See, Windows, NTDS, and there is a file with the name NTDS. So this is the Active Directory database we get. Right? Where this NTDS stands for New Technology Directory Services and DIT stands for Directory Information Tree. This is the database where all the users, computers, groups, OUs, containers, everything is stored as an object. So it checks this database, right? So who's taking care of the authentication and authorization in on-premise? A domain controller, or we can see our Active Directory. In cloud, we discussed how do we start the journey by creating the Azure account, right? So in cloud, what do we have? We have something called as Azure Active Directory, which people also refer as Azure AD, which we can also refer as AAD. Now, how do we get Azure Active Directory? We discussed earlier as well. We get Azure account, let's say v-2 JISI at outlook.com is my Azure account. Then we will get a default directory and we will get a domain. What will be the domain? 
v2 jisi outlook dot on microsoft dot com will be our domain. Now, if I want to create the users, these will be my cloud users or my Azure Active Directory users. Let's say I can create a user with the name user number one at v2 jisi outlook dot on microsoft dot com. Right. That is how we would be able to create the users like maybe user two and so on. Now let's say if I'm hosting some applications in cloud, maybe let's say cloud app one or cloud app two, would my cloud user, would they be able to access the cloud applications? Guys, would my cloud user, would they be able to access the cloud application? Yes. Okay. When they will try to access the cloud application, how will application come to know? What is the right username and password? Azure AD. Okay, and how will application reach out to Azure AD? The, the to register the application in AD, uh, the application registration, and from there we need to know where you get the client ID on the special gate, and then we need to integrate with our Azure as part of our integration now uh, using our application with Azure. That is what we need to do. Absolutely correct. So basically in order for Azure AD to do the authentication, we first need to register the application with Azure AD. We need to register these applications. How can we register the application? So when you go to your Azure Active Directory, there is something called as app registrations. Under Azure AD, you will find something called as app registrations. We need to go to app registrations. This is where app registration is and we need to register the application. When we register the application, we get two things. Application ID, people also call that as client ID. And we get application secret. People also refer that as client secret, right? So from here, maybe we can say new registration. From here, maybe we can say cloud app one, right? Here we can give the URI or URL. Let's say it's a web-based application or public native client, mobile or desktop based application, whatever the application is. So maybe I can give it a link, https colon slash slash cloudapp1.com, right? And I can say register. So once I click on register, we would be able to get application ID, application secret. So basically we need to register the application with Azure AD. My question to all of you, see, let's say we have got 5,000 users in on-premise. Obviously we do not want to create the users again, we do not want to do the duplication of the users. So what we can do, can my on-prem users, would they be able to access the cloud application? Obviously I want my users that we have in on-premise, they would be able to use these cloud applications as well. So would they be able to access the cloud application? Is that possible? It is possible. It should be like ideal scenario should be like this one on-premises and uh, cloud users also uh, should have the application access. No, no. So how it is going to be, we need to integrate with the uh, on-premise Azure AD2 with the uh, cloud Azure AD and from the cloud Azure yes. AD, we need to create a integration with the application. Yes, yes, yes. Hello? So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. See, the answers are absolutely correct. So basically what we need to do, we need to do some sort of a integration of on-premise with Azure, right? How can we do integration? There is a tool called as Azure AD Connect tool. There is a tool called as Azure AD Connect tool. We need to deploy this tool. Where do we deploy this tool? We deploy this tool in on-premise. In the on-premise machine, a machine which is domain join, a machine which is in trust with the domain controller, there we deploy this tool, right? So there we need to deploy this tool. What can we do with the help of this tool? With the help of this tool, we can sync the users from Azure AD to, sorry, from with the help of this, we can sync the users from on-premise to Azure AD. Please remember guys, it's only a one-way sync. We can only sync the users from on-premise to Azure AD. We cannot sync the users from Azure AD to on-premise. It is only a one-way sync. It is only a one-way sync, right? 
So basically, the users that we have created in on-prem, we would be able to get the users here. Monday at jitin.com and Tuesday at jitin.com. But there is a challenge here. The problem here is in the on-premise, the domain that I have got is jitin.com. That is my domain. In on-premise, sorry, in on-premise, the domain that I have got is jitin.com. In Azure AD, the domain that we have got is b2gisioutlook.onmicrosoft.com. We are bringing the users from on-prem to Azure, but the domain that is available in on-premise is not available in Azure AD. So when we try to sync the users, we would be able to sync the users, but the UPN will change. UPN stands for user principal name. Monday at jitin.com is the UPN. So UPN will change. We would be able to get the users, but users will become like this. Monday at v2jisioutlook.onmicrosoft.com. Why the UPN is changing? UPN is changing because this domain, jitin.com domain is not available in Azure AD. That is the reason this UPN is changing. So can you suggest something? What can we do to avoid the situation? Custom domain. We can uh, configure the custom domain at uh, Azure level. And uh, then we'll be just like uh, jetin.com. We will cust cust configure the custom domain at uh, Azure level. Absolutely. What we can do before syncing the users, we can configure the, we can add the custom domain name in Azure AD. If we add a custom domain name in Azure AD, then jitin.com domain will be available with Azure AD as well. Same domain is available in on-premise. Then the UPN will not change. Then the users would be able to come as it is. Right. Now, I'm able to get the users here. So on-prem users, now they are available with Azure AD as well. Can my on-prem users, can they access the cloud application now? Can my on-prem users, would they be able to access the cloud application now? Yes, because they registered, right? This application and everything is registered after this. Definitely, you get them. Answer is still no. Reason of syncing the users was the same. The intent was same. That my on-prem no, users... No, no, no. My my answer is what I said. After registration of app with Azure and linking between Azure AD with Azure, then only the user can be able to access the URL of the application. From there, they can be able to see what they have done. Oh, I'm I'm saying the same thing. See, we have registered the application with Azure AD. With the help of Azure AD Connect tool, we are able to sync the users from on-premise to Azure AD. Now, on-prem users are are there in Azure AD as well but still on-prem users would not be able to access the application. At this stage where, where we are sitting right now, on-prem users would not be able to access the application. Let me give you a diagrammatical view. Probably it will give you a better clarity. The intent was same. Why we were doing all these things, why we, we were creating a hybrid identity so that my on-prem users, they would be able to access the cloud application as well. But what we have discussed so far with the help of that, on-prem users would not be able to access the cloud application. There is a very small thing we are missing. Let's figure that out. So this is a diagram we have drawn. Let's do a naming convention quickly. So we are saying this is our on-premise where we have got domain controller or Active Directory, where we have got on-prem users and their passwords. This is the Azure AD Connect tool. Where do we deploy this tool? On the on-premise machine, a machine which is in domain join, or you can deploy this on a domain controller too, but not recommended. In cloud, we have Azure AD, where we have got cloud users and their passwords. This is something which we can consider as a user. And this is our applications, maybe Office 365, or you can say cloud application one, whatever you would like to consider. Right, or SharePoint online or anything that you would like to consider. And we are assuming that these applications are already registered with Azure AD. These are already registered with Azure AD, right? See, if it would be a cloud user, if it would be a cloud user, the user that we have created in Azure AD, 
user will go to the application page. It will go to office365.com. Application says, hey, enter the username and password. User will enter the username and password. Application is registered with Azure AD. Application will send the username and password to Azure AD for authentication. Application is registered with Azure AD. Application will send the username and password to Azure AD for authentication. Azure AD is the place where we already have got these users. Azure AD is the place where we have already got these users and their passwords as well. Azure AD will try to match the username and password shared by the application with the username and password available inside its database. If both of them matches, it issues a token to the application. It will issue a token to the application and user will be authenticated. But what about if it's an on-prem user? Cloud user, easily we were able to authenticate. User was created in Azure AD. Application is registered with Azure AD. But what about if it's the on-prem user? We discussed with the help of Azure AD Connect tool, we can sync the on-prem users. From on-prem to Azure AD, we can sync the on-prem users like this, right? So, if on-prem user will try to access the cloud application, it will go to the application page. Let's say office365.com. Application says enter the username and password. It will enter the username and password. On-prem user will enter the username and password. Application is registered with Azure AD. Application will send the username and password to Azure AD. Would Azure AD be able to authenticate on-premise user? Guys? Would Azure AD be able to authenticate on-premise user? Sir, replicating from on-premises to Azure AD, not, then why are we not authenticating? My question is, sir, is would Azure, it Azure, to... Azure, uh -huh. Azure AD connector tool is used to uh, take this user to the Azure, uh, the Azure AD, right? Mm -hmm. Where we have configured a custom. Zone. Your answer is yes right? or no? My answer is yes. You should be, you should have to like uh, authenticate because we are... Uh, Right. In this tool, we are uh, pushing this user to Azure AD. Right. See, answer is no. Reason being, with the help of Azure AD Connect tool, we discuss we are only able to sync the users. When application will send the username and password, as of now, Azure AD has only got the username. Without password, hmm. it would not be able to authenticate. So without password, authentication cannot happen. Right. So what we need to do when we are syncing the when we are configuring the Azure AD Connect tool, we need to define the authentication method as well, right? You may choose none as well. While syncing, you may choose none, but then authentication would not be possible. So we need to define the authentication method as well. We can go with password hash synchronization. We can go with PTA pass through authentication, we can go with federation with ADFS, right? We can go with federation with ADFS. Just give me one moment, guys.
uh, apologies for the inconvenience guys uh, okay so we were discussing regarding when we were syncing the users right so basically we were syncing the users here right so we can sync the users from on premise to azure ad and while syncing we need to define the authentication method so we can go with password hash synchronization we can go with pta pass to authentication we can go with federation with adfs right there is something called as ping federate as well like federation services itself is offered by multiple organization so we can also go with ping federate while configuring the authentication method we also get an option to enable single sign on so if you want to enable single sign on you can even enable single sign on as well also please remember whenever we are configuring the azure ad connect tool we need one user from azure ad who has a global admin rights or any user to whom we have given the global administrator role that user would be required as well in order to complete this configuration process so let's say here in this diagram we go with password hash synchronization right let's say in this diagram we go with password hash synchronization so what happens in password hash synchronization in password hash synchronization in password hash synchronization along with the on prem user we also syncs their passwords in the form of a hash along with the on prem user the password of the on prem user will also be synced in the form of a hash whenever we are whenever the domain controller is syncing the passwords in the form of a hash it do the hashing around 1000 times it do the hashing around 1000 times it do the hashing in such a manner that even if someone would be able to get hold of the on premise password hash they would not be able to convert it back into the plain text they would not be able to convert it back into the plain text right in this manner it will do a hashing and while sending the password it encrypts the password as well so what we are sending we are sending on prem user along with the encrypted password hash then we will decrypt the password here so azure ad will decrypt the password hash and it will store the password hash inside the user in the form of an attribute it will store the password hash inside the user in the form of an attribute now if on prem user will try to access the application it will go to the application page application says enter the username and password it will enter the username and password application is already registered with azure ad it will send the username and password to azure ad for authentication azure ad has already got the on prem user and the password hash it will try to match the username and password hash shared by the application with the username and password hash stored inside its database if both of them matches it issues a token if both of them matches it issues a token and that is how we would be able to access the application right that is how user on prem user would be able to access the application now maybe we do not want to go with password hash synchronization so guys before we move forward now tell me for some given reason if on premise goes down if domain controller goes down would my on prem user would it be able to access the cloud application if the domain controller is down would the on prem user would it be able to access the cloud application password hash synchronization there so azure ad will be also have the password but the new users which created on the directory which uh, before this uh, this uh, sync between this two on premises and azure ad uh, mm -hmm. the port goes down from uh, uh, sorry on premises domain goes down the users which already created and have their passwords has sync with the azure ad they will be have the access on this so the new user new users not. would not be able to old users because their passwords are already sync they would be able to access the application right while configuring the azure ad connect tool there is a feature called as password write back if we enable this feature while creating while configuring the azure ad connect tool there is a feature called as password write back if we enable this feature password write back feature then we can reset the password of on prem users from azure ad as well 
So using the cloud console, using the Azure AD console, we would be able to reset the passwords of on-prem users as well, right? Let's say maybe we do not want to go with password hash, then we can go with PTA. We can go with pass through authentication, right? So in pass through authentication, most of the diagram would be same. Okay, so let's try it here. So in pass through authentication, most of the diagram would be same. So here we have on-prem where we have domain controller. This is our Azure AD Connect tool. This is our users. The only thing that's get added here is PTA agents. And this is our Azure AD. So we can do the naming convention. Okay, so this is our on-premise where we have got domain controller or active directory, where we have got on-prem users and their passwords. This is our Azure AD Connect tool. These are the PTA agents. Why we have drawn multiple PTA agents for the high availability. If in case one goes down, the other one keeps on working. Where do we deploy these PTA agents? These PTA agents are deployed on the on-premise machine. Just like we deploy the Azure AD Connect tool on the on-premise machine, these PTA agents are also deployed on the on-premise machine, which is in trust with the domain controller. The on-prem machine, which is in trust with the domain controller. This is our Azure AD where we have got cloud users and their passwords. This is our application, could be Office 365, could be Cloud Application 1. So these applications are registered with Azure AD, right? And this is our user. So now mostly we are concerned about the on-prem user because cloud user can easily access the application. In PTA in pass-through authentication, we only sync the users from on-prem to cloud. We do not sync their passwords. We only sync the users. So on-prem users, we would be syncing here, right? We do not sync the passwords in any form, nor in plain text, nor in the form of a hash, nor in any other encrypted manner. We only sync the, we only sync the passwords in the form of a hash, right? We Sorry, we only sync the users. We do not sync the passwords in any form, nor in plain text, nor in the form of a hash, nor in any other encrypted manner. So if this on-prem user will try to access the cloud application, it will go to the application page. Application says, hey, enter the username and password. It will enter the username and password. Application will send the username and password to Azure AD. So, now Azure AD has only got the information about the on-prem user. It would not be able to authenticate the request. So what it does, it sends a username and while sending a password, it encrypts the password and it sends all this information to a queue. And it sends all this information to a queue. These PTA agents, they make an outbound call to this queue they make an outbound call to this queue and they make a secure outbound call, right? So they will make an outbound call and they make a secure outbound call on port 443. So what information they will get? They will get the username and the encrypted password. These PT agents, now they will make use of their private key, which only they have access to, and they will decrypt the passwords. They will decrypt the password. So what information they have now? They have username and the decrypted password. Now they have got the username and, and decrypted password. These PT agents, they are already in trust with the domain controller. They sends the username and password to domain controller for authentication. 
we already discussed that this domain controller has already got the Active Directory database, right? In C, Windows, NTDS, NTDS.dit. This is the Active Directory database. So it try to match the username and password shared by the PTA agent with the username and password available inside its database. If both of them matches, it issues a ticket. If both of them will match, it issues a ticket to the PTA agent. Right? So if both of them will match, it will issue a ticket to the PTA agent, which in turn this ticket will be shared to Azure AD. Azure AD will make use of this ticket and will create a token and will share that to the application. It will make use of this token and will create a token and will share the same with the application. So that is how the authentication will happen. That is how the authentication will take place. What happens if the link internet connection or VPN between Azure <coughs> on premises to Azure, uh, uh, Azure Cloud? Or sorry, Azure. sorry. What about the link between our internet link or VPN connection between on premises to Azure ready goes down? Mm -hmm. PT agent is on on premises, right? So, so you are saying the VPN VPN link, which VPN link you are referring to? VPN or internet connectivity on premises to Azure. Okay. How, how is the connectivity happening here between on premises to Azure? Over the internet, right? Over the internet. So you are saying if internet breaks, then what is the solution, right? Yes. Then the, this one is like a, then maybe authentication will not happen. Yes. Now, how can we achieve, see, now, do you have any control over the internet? See, for big organization, they have the multiple backup things mm -hmm. to, to the Azure cloud. But if the small organization is going to implement this kind of scenario, and if they, small, uh, small uh, organizations, most, small organizations, mostly they will not go with this scenario. This scenario is costly as compared to the previous one. If you have a look on the previous one, even if in case domain controller was going down, the authentication will still be continued because Azure AD yeah, is taking care of the authentication. Yes, even and the link is also down between these two, then also Azure AD will take care of this authentication. My, my, very, my very basic question is, if internet is down, would you be able to access the cloud-based applications? Internet means on my premises, like on, uh, what do you say? Like, uh, on prem, on premise is goes down internet connection. There are multiple factors because sometimes this uh, uh, no, municipal corporation dig out and fiber cut will happen, which disrupts the internet between our uh, uh, the uh, these one uh, people's or the premises. The link oh. goes to any companies. That that multiple scenario will happen. We can't assume that it will not. Right. So how to achieve the high redundancy in that case? Is it possible I can I can deploy domain controller one domain controller in site one and second controller second domain controller in site two, or maybe third domain controller I can create somewhere in a, in Azure Virtual Machine, right? Yes. So what yes. will happen? This PTA agent will try to reach out to this domain controller. If in case this domain controller would not be reachable, it will be reaching the domain controller on the next site then it will try to reach the domain controller on the so first it will try to re reach the domain controller within the same site let's say for some reason the same site is not available it will try to reach the domain controller on the second side what my question is if the country between this pt agent and uh, this one is down mm -hmm. uh, or azure so the pt agent will uh, reach to this uh, on premises okay and if the PTA is not able to communicate with the other uh, yeah. side, so then what? Just, just like we are deploying domain controller on multiple sites, similarly we can deploy domain, we can deploy PT agents on multiple sites as well. Okay. Right. Just like we were deploying domain controller on multiple sites on site A, site B, site C, and so on. Similarly, we can deploy multiple PT agents on different different sites. Two PT agents on site A, two PT agents on site B. If site A will fail, all the connections will be going to site B. Third thing, what we can do, 
if you want the high redundancy, see, whenever we are looking for any solution which is highly redundant, which is highly secure, we have to pay for that. So what we can do in this case is, in this case, we can connect the Azure AD, or you can say Microsoft Data Center. The Microsoft Data Center is a place where the Azure AD service is hosted. So you can connect Microsoft Data Center with your data center with the help of Express Route. With the help yeah. of Express Route, you get dedicated connection, dedicated line. So maybe you will be using that as a primary connection. If in case that is failing, then you are dependent upon internet. If in yes. case, now in this case, if the internet is failing, it will not make a difference to us because anyhow, we are using a dedicated line. So we can try to achieve the high redundancy for the same. Does that answer your query, sir? Yes. Okay, so guys, out of password, uh -huh. one small question, uh, Jatin. The we are saying that uh, application cloud application authentication. Uh, if suppose any customized application which is hosted on any server in Azure AD, right now we are considering Office 365 or Cloud app, right? Means Azure app. So if uh, we are uh, considering any uh, third party or our customized application which are hosted on one VM on this Azure environment. So in that case, this authentication, uh, we have to configure the authentication in this application code, right? How they are at the, like uh, authentication will happen. You have to define the authentication in the application you are saying. So when you are registering yeah. the application, the Azure AD application will be sending out the credentials to Azure AD. And while okay. configuring, yes. while, yeah, let me complete. while configuring the Azure AD connect tool, we have used one identity from Azure AD as well. While configuring the Azure AD Connect tool, we have used one global administrator from Azure AD as well. So, right, this identity will be used for the configuration part of the Azure AD Connect tool, which we have put in on-premise. So when we are doing that, eventually Azure AD comes to know what is the authentication mechanism we are using in on-prem. Accordingly, it will be sending the information for the same. Suppose I have two, three applications and one group of users or one department have access to one application, other department have access to other uh, second application. Then Where how the application we... is hosted. Yeah, yes, the application, one is uh, as a uh, web service, Azure, Azure web services, and other is, other is on uh, one uh, virtual machine. Like uh, suppose one Linux box is there and application is configured on web server or on Apache server, the application is configured. So in that case, if you are saying that uh, we are doing authentication with the uh, 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 application version, okay. So custom application we can register there, right? And so how the access we can control there? Means uh, suppose I have two projects, one is Microsoft and another is Dell. Micro uh, Dell is on... Uh, uh, one virtual machine, uh, web, Apache server, server they are using web application and Dell users will be goes to the Apache web server for, uh, and they, there you are uh, typing the username password and authentication will happen with the uh, Azure AD. Other is a uh, Microsoft web application. Okay. Uh, web application, other team will be accessed that web application. In both the cases, if we are registering the application as a custom application there, in how the permissions will be assigned, where will we, we should have to assign permission. In, application registration level we have to assign or we have to uh, give the permission in the code means uh, how the application will be happening. See, although these things get discussed in a different course altogether, but since you have asked, let me give you a basic scenario. When you register the application with Azure AD, when you register the application with Azure AD, you will start seeing these applications in the enterprise applications as well. Basically, your question is who would be able to access these applications? How can we control the behavior of the application, right? So, yes, you would application be able to, access control. Right. You would be able to see these applications in the enterprise applications. I hope you can see here, Jitin application one. This application, now if I go one step back, if I go to app registrations, Jitin app one is registered with Azure AD. Under app registrations, I have registered this Jitin app one with Azure AD, right? So once you register the, you will do what? You will register the application here with Azure AD. Once you do that, you will start seeing this application in the enterprise application list. So when you go to enterprise application, you would be able to see this application here. When you click on this Jitin app one from here, you would be able to control all this behavior. Who would be able to, which users and which groups would be able to access it? 
who will be the owner of these applications. If you want to use single sign on for this application or not, do you want to use any application proxy for this application or not? So from here you would be able to control this. Does that answer your query? Okay, if I mention here as a, a group here, so that group will have the web access, means access to the application, right? Absolutely. And same for this, the, the Apache web server, which we have posted on uh, one VM in Azure. So for that my, Apache- My also question is, yeah, I, I have a question before difference? I answer that. I, I would like to ask a question from you before I answer that. Inside the Linux box, you have hosted an application, right? Yes. How will that application reach out to Azure AD for authentication? That is my ask actually. The in 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 general scenario, it should be like what what you know, knowledge I have. Uh, if the users are uh, when I open the application, I will put username and password. Okay, there. From there, the application will take the username and password, and they will send it to the authenticator, means a AD identity provider who is uh, serving this authentication. So generally, it should have to uh, happening from this uh, the code only where they have mentioned. We have to uh, this request to divert. Let me let me share some update here. See what happens is whenever you are hosting any application that is outside Azure, then you can make use of service principle. Right. What you have to do again, you will be see what is service principle. You will be creating an application here. Right. In the app registrations, you will be registering an application or creating an application, whatever you would like to refer. So let's say you are creating an Apache Tomcat or whatever you are creating. So whatever application you are creating, I'm just giving it a name on-prem one, right? You will go here on-prem one, you will give the URL here. Let's say it is a web-based public line native mobile or desktop application, right? Or it could be a single page application, whatever you have created. Maybe you can give it a name. Uh, okay, let's say you give it a name on-prem app one. So let's say you give it a name this on-prem app one, right? And now you will say register. Now inside the Linux box or inside the VM Windows box, wherever you have hosted the application, obviously you would have created that application using some sort of an IDE, maybe Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code or whatever IDE you, you would be using. Within that application code, you will have to provide this application ID. Within this application code, the application code that you have, you need to provide this application ID. Now this is, we are considering as a service principle now. And you need to go to certification secrets and you have to generate a secret. So you have to provide the application ID and application secret where inside the application code you have to provide this. So maybe I can say on-prem application one secret. So we have got the application ID and now here we have got the application secret. This is the application secret we have got the secret. You can copy paste it on, on notepad or somewhere. And then you have to provide this information inside the application code. Then that application would be able to reach out to on-premise for authentication with the help of this service principle. With the help of this service principle. Does that answer your query? Yes. Yeah. I got an answer. And you didn't add one question. So if the secret is getting expired, okay, and uh, as an admin, we need to uh, generate a new secret. That secret needs to be uh, added in application. Is that true, or uh, how it is going to be in real time? Absolutely true. If it's expiring, authentication will not happen. Mm -hmm. You have to come to Azure AD. You have to come to the service principle. You have to generate a new secret. Very simple. You can just click on here, new client secret, right? Okay. Can we share this with the team, right? Our development is going to operate there. Sorry? No, we need to share these secrets with the development team as well, right? And they need to update that. 
Absolutely. So either if the development team is doing this, then you have to share the secret with the development team. If you can do that on your own, then you can do it on your no, own. No, no. My question is, is there any interlink between application code with the secrets? It is a centralized environment I could understand. What I'm asking, if we regenerate the secret, it will be populated in behind the scenes uh, by the Azure and it will move on. Actually, no, no, no. See, see, you don't have to see in, in enterprise world, Raghavindra, you would not be going ahead and you would not be sharing the secret to the development team. What best practice we do is there is something called as key vault. Actually, we have not covered that section. So I was not jumping on okay. that. There is something called as okay. key vault. So let's say you okay. are the one who has changed the secret. You will simply go ahead and you will update the value in the key vault. Okay. Right. Okay. And you would be using some sort of a managed identity or some sort of a service principle who would be fetching the information from the key vault. Okay. The key or key vault is taking care of all those uh, things, operation things. Okay. I got it. Right. The product will take it. Yeah. Right. I so it. instead of sharing it, it see, you are sharing it over, just allow me one moment. If you are sharing it over Teams or if you are sharing it over the email, and let's say if some person who is acting like a bad actor, is standing in, in, in behind your shoulder. So he would be able to make a note of this key. So as a best practice, okay. we can simply put this into the key vault, right? We are not sharing okay. it anywhere. So, and we will be using a managed identity or a service principle who can fetch the information from the key vault, right? So we don't have okay. to share this with anyone else. So the use case is what, what whenever we are going to share any credentials to any of the team, we need to manage key or shoot key vault. And from the, with the help of that, uh, you know, uh, the key value part, we need to share the name of the secret and share with them and they will call the names. The stuff in keyword will take that. Okay. Absolutely correct. Spot on. Thank you. Thank you. So can we, can we configure like a, a client secrets, these uh, secrets which we have created? Suppose it is expiring uh, uh, like 22, uh, 625. So can we like uh, add uh, uh, one more secret before expiring it? Also that after first will be goes down, then second activity will come up. Kind of See, when you when you go to the key vault, it's you get an option. Yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. That will be the real time scenario. Anyhow, we yeah. will not wait for the certificate to expire and then we will renew it. So when you yes. go to the key vault, there you can set the reminder as well, rotation mm -hmm. that you can rotate this key. There is something called as okay. There is something called as I'm skipping the name. Yeah, there is something called as runbook. It's a part okay. of automation account. Inside Azure, there is something called as automation account. Inside automation account, there are multiple things we can do. We can make use of desired state configuration. We can create runbooks from there. So beauty of runbook is you can do the automation basically. You can set the reminder that after every two months or after every four months on so-and-so time, let's say at 7 a.m. in the morning, you want to change the, you want to generate a new secret. You just need to write the PowerShell script. You want to generate a new secret and then you want to update the value inside the key vault. So you can achieve that with the help of runbook. Inside the automation account, we would be able to create the runbooks. After creating a runbook, we would be able to schedule a runbook. We can add a schedule. We want to do this activity daily. We want to do this activity after a month. We want to do this activity after six months. So we can schedule that activity as well. So that's how we would be able to achieve this. Okay. Uh, you can currently repeat this. I'm, I'm not able to follow you somehow. Can you please uh, repeat what you said for uh, Azure Automate? Let me give you one more example, right? Then it will give you more clarity. Now, let's say you guys are running 100 machines. Maybe all of them are web application. We are running same web application on 100 machines. What we have seen our users, most of the requests are coming from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. After 9 p.m., we hardly get any request. Would it be feasible or would it be wise to keep all the 100 machines on even after 9 p.m.? No. no, no. Some requests may come. For that, maybe we can leave one or two machines open or on. Rest 98 machines we can stop so that we would be able to save good amount of cost from 9 p.m. to maybe 8.45 a.m. in the morning. For 11 hours and 45 minutes, we would be able to save the cost of 98 virtual machines. Would you be able okay. to stop the virtual machines manually every day at 9 p.m.? Possible? It's not no. possible. No. Not possible, yeah. 
Now, instead of 100 machines, if it would be 1,000 machines, can you stop 1,000 machines or 998 machines? For that only, we have Ansible playbooks all those aspects, right? If just like just like we have Ansible playbooks, similarly in Azure, there is something called as Runbook. Just like we are using Ansible playbooks, we, are, we use Ansible. It's a configuration. We use it for the configuration management. Inside yes. Ansible, we have playbooks. Similarly, yes. see, Ansible is not the only tool with the help of which we can achieve configuration yes. management. So Azure yes. has given something called as Azure account. Sorry, automation account. Inside automation account, we have something called as runbook. We can achieve the same with the help of this. So either you achieve it with the help of Ansible playbook, either you achieve it with the help of automation account runbook. So what skill is required here? Uh, there we need to write the YAML file inside and here what skill is required in order to write that uh, PowerShell. So that. see, in, in runbook, there are multiple types of runbook you can have. You can have a PowerShell runbook, mostly or widely uses PowerShell runbook. You can have a graphical okay. runbook. You can have a PowerShell workflow runbook. You can have a Python runbook. But as I mentioned, mostly or widely uses PowerShell. So you have to write a PowerShell script. So in Azure point of view, uh, so PowerShell is a right uh, scripting thing, which uh, it has a wide variety of you know, things which you can automate by using PowerShell. You am right, or, or Azure CLI is a right option. See, it depends. So PowerShell or CLI, basically both of them are scripting languages, which you can use for the yeah. automation. So maybe there yeah. is one person who is good with CLI. So he, he or she may use CLI. If you're good with PowerShell, you can use PowerShell, right? If you're good with both, maybe you can decide when to use what. So both of them- That is my question. My, I need to know that uh, when to use or what, okay. Uh, when I look at uh, Azure Automate, I could understand that, you know, uh, whatever things which we developed in Azure CLI, we cannot use in Azure Automate. Either we need to come down to uh, PowerShell only, right? In this case, uh, so after, you know, uh, spending a lot of time with automate by using Azure CLI, the PowerShell uh, won't work right. So we need to convert it to PowerShell script and then it will work. So that is my question because of the pain point which I face, that is I'm asking you. See, uh, Raghavinda, see, it is, see, now let's say tomorrow, uh, let's say tomorrow if you will be working on Kubernetes, then most of the things we would be able to achieve with the help of YAML. Now, if a person doesn't know YAML or if a person doesn't know PowerShell, there are ways to achieve it. See, one way is we can learn that particular scripting language. Second way is inside the automation account, let's say there is a person who is good with Azure CLI, but now he's stuck. He's stuck because inside the automation account, we need to use PowerShell. When you go to run book, when you go to run book, there is something called as run book gallery. Inside run book gallery, there are a lot of run books available, already available run books. If I give you a very, very layman terms example, let's say I don't know how to cook Maggie or how to cook food. Maggie is available. I can get it from a store and I can just cook it in simply two minutes, right? Similarly, inside the runbook gallery, auto already pre-configured, already created runbooks are there. You can import them. So if you do not oh, know how to okay. write the code, you can simply import that runbook, which you need to use. So let's say I want to stop my machines. There is a runbook called as in PowerShell gallery, there will be a runbook called as stop VMs. I will import that runbook. And after so that- That's it, we need to call out the RVM details and uh, we need to run that uh, PowerShell. Absolutely. Absolutely. If someone uh, who's not good in PowerShell, and Sashul is not coding Azure CLI for Automate, right? I'm right around. Right. Jatin, coming to this uh, question. So right now we are using uh, this user as uh, a SPL. Uh, so uh, the server might be hosted in Azure or any other environment. We can do the authentication with the Azure ID with this SPL, right? Absolutely. Yeah, means suppose the I have the web server which hosted in IBM environment or IBM cloud or AWS cloud with this configuring this SPN, we can do the authentication with Azure AD for the server single sign. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Any other question, guys? Okay. 
Now, how can we secure these identities? So there are multiple ways by which we would be able to secure these identities. One is we have something called as MFA. That is multi-factor authentication, right? As we all know, what is multi-factor authentication? So basically with the help of single element, we would not be able to complete the authentication. We need minimum two elements. First element could be your username and password. Second element could be something which you possess, maybe a phone where you can get an OTP, right? Or maybe an email address where you can get the email. Or it could be some sort of a fingerprint, some sort of a biometric, something which you are, right? So we need minimum two elements to complete the authentication. How can we enable multi-factor authentication? Uh, let me just log into a different account so that I would be able to show you more things on MFA. Just allow me a moment here. Okay, so we can see here. Okay. Now, if we want to enable multi-factor authentication, we can go to Azure Active Directory. Under Azure Active Directory, there is something called as users, right? We are trying to enable multi-factor authentication for the users. So we can go to this user section. When we go to user section, here we have got something called as per user MFA. So here we would be able to see all the users. We can click on per user MFA. When we click on per user MFA, here we would be able to see a page where we would be able to see all the users and there will be small check boxes in front of them. And there will be small check boxes in front of them. So for whatever user we would like to enable, see, let's say if I want to enable MFA for, for these two users, I can click on these two users and I can enable MFA for these two users. I can say enable. So multi-factor authentication will be enabled for these two users. I'm enabling multi-factor authentication, but how they would be able to complete multi-factor authentication for that I can go to service settings. Maybe from our end can give them three options. Either they can get a code onto their mobile as an SMS, or they can get a code via mobile app or they can get a verification code from mobile app or hardware token. So we can give them three options. During the time of the registration, they can choose any one out of these three and they can proceed with their MFA. So either they can get a text message to their phone or they can get the notification through mobile app or they can get the verification code from mobile app or hardware token, right? That's how they would be able to do this. If we want to explore more settings of multi-factor authentication, we can go to Azure Active Directory and then we can go to security. We can go to Azure Active Directory and then we can go to security. So when we go to security here, there is something called as MFA. There is something called as MFA. We can click on this MFA here. So here it says account lockout. Now what is account lockout? Let's say a user is getting the MFA code, but user is entering the MFA code incorrectly. After how many times a user has entered the MFA code incorrectly, the account will be locked out. Maybe I'm saying if user has entered the code incorrectly three consecutive times, the account should be locked out. 
within how many minutes he has entered the code incorrectly i am saying within 20 minutes if the user is entering the code incorrectly three times then the account should be locked out minutes until the account will automatically be unblocked maybe i am saying after 60 minutes the account will automatically be unblocked then there is an option called as block or unblock user maybe let's say you would like to block some user block or unblock user means for any user for which mfa is enabled for any user for which mfa is enabled if you block the user user would not be able to receive the mfa code right a block user will not receive multi factor authentication request authentication attempt for that user will be automatically denied a user will remain blocked for 90 days from the time they are blocked to manually unblock a user click on the unblock action right so from here we would be able to block or unblock a user let's say i want to block this user maybe user one at jitin.com whatever the reason is i can define the reason here and i can block the user so for this user if mfa is enabled if i have blocked the user user would not be able to receive the mfa code so obviously user would not be able to perform the actions if you want to unblock a user you can unblock the user from here so from here we would be able to unblock the user then there is a section called as fraud alert fraud alert is like let's say i use my credit card to make an online transaction on an e-commerce site maybe today i have not used my card but i receive an otp So let's say today we receive the, let's say I use my credit card to make an online transaction, right? I use a credit card to make an online transaction. Today I have not used my card, but I received an OTP that this is the OTP for your transaction. Obviously I'll come to know some kind of a fraud is happening with my card. Similarly, let's say a user is not trying to access the application, but user receives an OTP that this is the OTP for your transaction user will come to know some sort of a fraud is happening, right? User will come to know that some sort of a fraud is happening. What can we do? So do we want to allow the users to submit the fraud alerts? We are saying yes. If in case any user is submitting a fraud alert, do we want to block that user? We are saying yes, automatically block the user who is reporting a fraud. What is the code to report the fraud? So let's say user receives a phone call that if you have initiated this request, so maybe the call would be like this. Uh, Hi, I'm from Microsoft Authenticator or Authentication. If you have pressed, if you have initiated this request, press the pound key, press the hash key. So before you press the hash key, you need to press this code. So zero followed by hash key. If you press zero followed by hash key, then system will automatically come to know that you have reported the fraud and it will block the user there and there. This code could be zero, it could be nine, it could be 15, it could be 99, it could be anything, right? It could be anything. So zero followed by the hash key will automatically block the user. That is how we can make use of multi-factor authentication. So the message will be delivered to users phone, uh, phone number and from there they will uh, report it as a fraud. We, we get the phone call. See, when we are authenticating, we have two options. Whether we would like to get a... Do you want me to show you that option in the real time? Let me try to show you that. Because... Uh... Just, just allow me one moment. I think once I'll show you, although I will be using my corporate ID a bit. Let me try to show you.
So what I'll try to do, I'll try to log in with one of my corporate account, right? Let's say if I try to log in here. You will see here something. It says in order to authenticate, first I have to enter my password, right? So it says, hey, enter your password. So let's say I enter my password. Now let me on my phone as well so that you would be able to hear the phone call as well. See, that is how it will come. I hope you're getting this option call. So if I say call, this is what I'm doing. This is what I am doing. But let's say I'm not, I have not initiating this request. Still, I will get a phone call on my mobile, right? So I'm getting a phone call. Guys, I hope you're able to see this call or hear this call. This is what yeah. I will get. Your verification. Right. So it says, please press the pound key. So if I have not initiated this request, if I have not initiated this request, then I'll still press the pound key. But first, I will press this code. So zero followed by the pound key. Zero followed by the pound key. If I press this code followed by the pound key, system will come to know that I have reported the fraud and it will block the user then and there. Okay, so, but now we have this one call from this one. You are organizing that. Follow the uh, press the pound key. So if I mention here, uh, if I on it, so it will give one more option is like press zero or press zero followed by the pound key. If this is a fraud call, is it like that? No, no, no. See, I you. How we communicate to the users? How we communicate to the users that if you are not using your account to log in, then you report it. Okay. Mm -hmm. For authentication, I understand you got a phone call and you press hash key and you are authenticated. You are uh, like, uh, uh, this is genuine, genuine uh, authentication. Mm -hmm. But if, if if any other person is authenticating and if I get a call, then it will ask me to press a hash, hash pound, okay, for authentication. But I want to report it, this is fraud. Mm -hmm. Then how I sh should I have to communicate to all the users to press zero and hash? How do you, this? How do you communicate in the enterprise world? What do you follow in your organization? See, every organization, every MNC has a certain standards that they meet or they need to maintain, right? Yes, now, yes. let me ask you this. I'll, I'll answer this question if in case you will. Uh, let's, let me get everyone's input. Then we'll share the exact answer to this. So guys, let's say if you are working in the enterprise world and you need to share and you need to share some very... Uh, in very valuable information, which is regarding the security, how will you update your team? How will you update the organ? How will you update the team members who are supposed to follow this? So how will you do this? There are ways of doing this. See, one, one may say that we can do it with the help of, we can take, conduct a team meeting and we can do it with the help of this. Second is we would be able to float an email, maybe multiple email with multiple reminders. The best practice or the industry standard is you will inform them and then you will be launching a course. Maybe your organization would be using a learning management systems where we get some courses that are mandatory for us to complete. I hope all of you are doing those courses. Yes, Jatin, we are uh, going through security uh, uh, awareness training and all this. If uh, anything uh, fraud emails, how to report it as a what you can spam, spam or how to report the incident. Uh, 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 Rajaram, actually, let me reiterate what uh, Jatin said. See, let's say in recently we had a Java vulnerability issue by you know Nagpur team vulnerability. Okay, it recently it uh, pop up to the entire world, right? So during the time, uh, we need to educate to all the developers in the organization. In this case, what we need to do, uh, we need to uh, a security team from the organization we shouldn't want a training program to everyone, stating that what is do's and don'ts when you are facing those binaries, okay? So that training program will give the all awareness to the entire team. That is one of the training awareness which we need to give to the team. That is tip number one. That is what we can say to everyone. Yeah, understood. But but uh, see if anybody is using ICC CC card that I don't know. But uh, suppose any transaction if I do with the ICC credit card, then they send them one message. If you are doing you did this transaction, 
please okay See, you, you know this, if, 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 yeah yeah if you are if this this is not a genuine transition from you please report it as a uh, fraudulent transaction so that option they have given okay or the sms so my question is if i is there any, there any kind of provision here also that two options means if you are genuine users then press hash if you are not a genuine user then not to become press no followed by hash no followed by hash. call back from call back to the end uh, user who is using that account yes yes if genuine is if genuine authentic is there please press hash if not then press zero hash that what i am this So that uh, that feature available in uh, Azure AD, uh, did you? Sorry, uh, I'm sorry. Please, please again. That is available in Azure AD. Jatin, Jatin, Jatin. Right now, you got a call that the authentication. You pressed hash. Then authentication happened. So my option is if there is any kind of provision. If not, then press zero hash. If any kind of. Now you got a call from this for the authentication, right, on your mobile. I I initiated that request. and that is the reason okay. i pressed hash let's say if i would not have initiated that request then i will be pressing zero followed by hash okay so is mm -hmm. okay. so that in, in voice call is, is it saying that press hash uh, while uh, it says uh, when press the pound key pound yeah, is okay hash. pound key yeah pound so is it uh, saying that press pound key yeah yeah do you want to yeah. hear that again No, 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 not like that. Actually, just what if if you are not initiated the authentication, then press zero hash. Yeah. This kind of process there or not? See, this this uh, that lady will not tell the the automatic voice will not tell. This is something which we have to we have to do. So if I have okay. initiated the request, it says, hey, if you have initiated this request, press the pound key. I will simply press the pound key. If I am the person who has initiated this request, but let's say I have not initiated this request, still I get a call. that hey this is the mobile microsoft authenticator if you have initiated this request press the pound key i know in my organization code to report the fraud is zero i will press zero followed by the hash key as soon as i press zero followed by the hash key azure ad will come to know that i have reported the fraud that fraud is happening with my identity and it will block my user okay it will block my user okay. any question any query no question at all okay so that is all for my end for today guys we will continue tomorrow and we will take it further from there i think all of you will have a small uh, get together arrange if not then enjoy your christmas eve or christmas evening so we will connect tomorrow and we will take it further from there uh, jaitin one more request yeah. on uh, for like a conceptual basis basis like for concept it is very good actually but i think we have to like uh, explore the scenarios kind of uh, actually implement it right i'll be giving you labs after tomorrow i'll be giving you labs okay. then you will be doing those labs so you will start getting the practical exposure as well don't miss yeah the means I'll, give the scenarios and all this thing how we are going to implement our how to after tomorrow session i'll start giving you labs these are official this course labs so okay. you will be doing those labs That's and you will be getting a handsome experience on the same okay Thank okay uh, i think one uh, i'm i'm so sorry i missed the message earlier please explain the basics of azure ready sync components and how it works uh sara can you please explain uh, can you please elaborate more like what exactly you are trying to us see what the sync is doing is when we are syncing the azure ready connect I'm, to uh, yeah sorry yeah, so, sorry sorry i'm just talking about the basic architecture like uh, how the sync is uh, working from the azure ready connect uh, perspective like uh, metaverse and that those components and how uh, how the the sync is actually happening and those things okay are you looking for the, the metaverse the and source are, anchor you are referring yeah, to yeah yes 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 and and the outbound connection and those things in the tool itself we can see that right ad synchronization tool maybe you will be you will be taking this later I just I, i i just wanted to mention this uh, point Sure, sure, sure. So we'll explain you regarding the metaverse. Just allow me some time. We'll explain you. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. And Jigen, so I have successfully integrated with the uh, Azure B2C with Azure AD. Okay, B2B, and we don't need to import any user right, Jigen. Okay, so with help of Microsoft team, uh, I made it, and uh, it is working fine without any issues. That's good. Wonderful.
Okay, guys. So I think we are good for today. So I'm stopping the screen sharing and I'm stopping the recording as well. Welcome.